Hello, everyone. It's Sun from Stories Untold Till Now. I'm going to bring you a story about America's most prolific sweethearts, Bonnie and Clyde. These lovebirds set a new precedent for partner in crime and gave new meaning to Till Death Do We Part. We'll start with Bonnie and her younger years before crime became rampant in her life. Bonnie Parker was born on October 1st, 1910 in Rowan, Texas. She was the middle child in her family. Her siblings were Emma and Henry Parker. They did have another sibling named Coley, but unfortunately he died as a baby due to crib death, or known as SIDS. It is when an infant dies with no explanation. The family lived quite comfortably for years to come as her father was a bricklayer. In 1914, however, unfortunately, tragedy struck as the father died unexpectedly. During this time, Bonnie was only four years old. Now that her mother was a newfound widow, she moved back with her parents in Cement City, Texas. This place was now part of Dallas. Of course, Bonnie and her siblings moved into their grandparents' house, and this is where the story starts to set in motion. We now fast forward to high school. Bonnie loved writing and is said to be doing very well in school. That all changes, however, at the age of 16. In high school, she met a boy named Roy Thornton. They quickly became enamored with each other and dropping out of high school to get married. They married on September 25th, 1926, six days before her 16th birthday. Their marriage was full of issues as Roy spent less and less time at home and continued to get involved with the law as he was doing things he obviously wasn't supposed to be. In 1929, he was charged with robbery and sentenced to five years in prison. They never got divorced. While Roy was away, Bonnie worked as a waitress, but was unemployed as the Great Depression got started toward the end of 1929. As luck would have it, they would never cross paths again after that year. Now we'll discuss Clyde's younger years, as he is the other side of this coin. Clyde Chestnut Barrow was born on March 24, 1909, in Teleco, Texas, the sixth of eight children. Clyde's parents were tenant farmers often not making enough money to feed their children. When he was 12, his parents gave up tenant farming and moved to West Dallas, where his father opened a gas station. The barrels spent their first months in West Dallas living under their wagon until they got enough money to buy a tent. West Dallas was a rough neighborhood, and Clyde fit right in. He and his older brother Marvin, Ivan Barrow, who was often nicknamed Buck, were often in trouble with the law for stealing things such as turkeys and cars. Clyde was reported to be small, standing five foot seven and weighing 130 pounds. He had two serious girlfriends before he met Bonnie, but he never married. Clyde was first arrested in late 1926 at the age of 17 after running when police confronted him over a rental car that he had failed to return on time. His second arrest was with his brother Buck soon after the possession of Solitland turkeys. Burrow had some legitimate jobs during 1927 through 1929, but he also cracked safes, robbed stores, and stole cars. Bonnie and Clyde soon met at a mutual friend's house in January 1930. Their attraction was instantaneous. A few weeks later, Clyde was sentenced to two years in prison for previous crimes, and Bonnie was devastated. On March 11, 1930, Clyde was sent to Eastman Prison Farm at the age of 21. He escaped from a jail using the gun Bonnie had smuggled in. A week later, he was recaptured and sentenced to 14 years in the brutal Eastman Prison Farm near Weldon, Texas. It was reported that Clyde was repeatedly sexually assaulted while in prison, and he retaliated by attacking and killing a tormentor with a pipe, crushing his skull in. This was his first killing. Another inmate who was already serving life claimed responsibility. Clyde arrived at Eastman on April 21st. Life was unbearable, and he became desperate to get out, hoping a physical incapacity would earn him a transfer. He asked a fellow prisoner to chop off his two toes with an axe. Because of this, he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. It proved unnecessary, though. He was paroled a week later on February 2nd in 1932. Without his knowledge, Beryl's mother had successfully petitioned for his release. His sister, Mary, said, Something awful sure must have happened to him in prison because he wasn't the same person when he got out. Fellow inmate Ralph Fultz said that he watched Clyde change from a schoolboy to a rattlesnake. Clyde swore that he would rather die than return there. Leaving prison during the Depression with jobs as scarce as they were made living in society difficult. Plus, Clyde had little experience holding a job as his foot healed, he was back to robbing. Bonnie went with him on one of these robberies. The plan was for the Barrow Gang, which included, at different times, Ray Hamilton, W.D. Jones, Buck Barrow, Blanche Barrow, and Henry Methvin, in order to Bonnie and Clyde to rob a hardware store. Although she stayed in the car during the robbery, Bonnie was captured and put into Coffham, Texas jail, but she was soon released because of lack of evidence. While Bonnie was in jail, Clyde and Hamilton staged another robbery in April of 1932. It was supposed to be easy, but something went wrong, and the general store's owner, John Butcher, was shot and killed. Bonnie wrote poetry to pass time in jail. She reunited with Clyde a few weeks after her release from Coffin County Jail.
On August 5th, Clyde, Raymond Hamilton, and Ross Dyer were drinking moonshine at a country dance in Stringtown, Oklahoma, when Sheriff C.G. Maxwell and Deputy Eugene C. Moore approached them in the parking lot. Clyde and Hamilton opened fire, killing Moore and gravely wounding Maxwell. Moore was the first law officer whom Clyde and his gang killed. They eventually murdered nine. On October 11th, they allegedly killed Howard Hall at his store during the robbery in Sherman, Texas, although some historians consider this unlikely. W.D. Johns had been a friend of Clyde's family since childhood. He joined Parker and Clyde on Christmas Eve of 1932, and the three left Dallas that night. The next day, Christmas Day of that year, Jones and Bonnie murdered Doyle Johnson, a young family man, while stealing his car in Temple. Clyde killed Tarrant County Deputy Malcolm Davis on January 6, 1933, where he and Bonnie and Jones wandered into the police trap set for another criminal. The gang had murdered five people since April. Bonnie now faced a decision. Stay with Clyde on the life of the run or leave him and start fresh. Bonnie knew Clyde had vowed never to return to prison and that staying with him meant death for both most likely very soon. Despite this knowledge, Bonnie decided not to leave Clyde and remained loyal to the very end. For the next two years, Bonnie and Clyde robbed across Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Louisiana, and New Mexico. They stayed close to a state border because police then couldn't cross state boundaries to follow a criminal. Clyde changed cars frequently by stealing one and changed the license plates even more frequently. He studied maps and had an uncanny knowledge of back roads. Police didn't know then that Bonnie and Clyde made frequent trips to Dallas to see their families. Bonnie was close to her mother, whom she insisted on seeing every couple of months. Clyde frequently visited his mother and his favorite sister, Nell, which nearly got them killed several times in police ambushes. They had been on the run for a year when Clyde's brother, Buck, was released from prison in the March of 1933. Law enforcement wanted the two for murder, bank robbery, auto theft, robbing dozens of grocery stores and gas stations, but they decided to rent an apartment in Joplin, Missouri for a reunion with Buck and his wife, Blanche. According to family sources, Buck and Blanche were there to visit. They attempted to persuade Clyde to surrender to law enforcement. The group ran loud, alcohol-fueled card games late into the night in the Nick neighborhood. Blanche recalled that they bought a case of beer that day. The men came in, went noisily at all hours, and Clyde accidentally fired a bar in the apartment while cleaning it. The bar is his gun. No neighbors went to the house, but no one reported suspicions to the Joplin Police Department. The police assembled a five-man force into the two cars on April 13th to confront what they had suspected were bootleggers living in the garage apartment. The Barrow Brothers and Jones opened fire, killing Detective Harry L. McGinnis outright and fatally wounding Constable J.W. Harryman. Bonnie, Clyde, Buck, and Jones got to their car and sped away. They picked up Blanche, who had escaped the shooting nearby. Although they got away, police found a trove of information in the apartment, including rolls of film, with the now f infamous images of Bonnie and Clyde in various poses holding guns, and Bonnie's poem, The Story of Suicide Sal. One of the two she wrote on the run, and the other was The Story of Bonnie and Clyde. The pictures and poems and the gateways increased their fame. They evaded trouble until June of 1933 when they had an accident near Wellington, Texas. Clyde realized too late that the bridge ahead had been closed for repairs. He swerved and the car went down an embarkment. Clyde and Jones got out safely, but Bonnie's leg was burned badly by leaking battery acid and she's never been able to walk properly again. Despite her injuries, they couldn't stop for medical care. Clyde nursed Bonnie with the help of Blanche and Billy, Bonnie's sister. Jones reportedly said that, She'd been burned so bad, none of us thought she was going to live. The height on her right leg was gone, from her hip all the way down to her ankle. I could see bone at places. A month later, Bonnie, Clyde, Buck, and Blanche and Jones checked into two cabins at Red Crown Tavern near Palat City, Missouri on July 19, 1933. Police, tipped by locals, surrounded the cabin at 11 p.m. A policeman banged on the cabin door. Blanche replied, Just a minute, let me get dressed, giving Clyde time to pick up the, his Browning automatic rifle, or the BAM, and start shooting. While the others took cover, Buck kept shooting and was shot in the head. Buck had sustained a bullet wound that had blasted a large head in his forehead skull and exposed his injured brain, and Blanche was nearly blinded by the glass fragments in both her eyes. Clyde gathered everyone, including Buck, for a charge to the garage. As they roared off, police shot out two tires and shattered a window. The shard severely damaged one of Blanche's eyes, as stated before. Clyde drove through the night and the next day, stopping only to change bandages and tires, the Burrow Gang camped at Dexfield Park, an abandoned amusement park near Dexter, Iowa. On July 24th, Buck sometimes was semi-conscious, he even talked and ate, but his massive head wound and loss of blood were so severe that Barrow and Jones dug a grave for him. During this time, they did not know that the police had been alerted to their presence by a local farmer who had found 
bloodied bandages. Uh, quick interception here, guys. Um, Barrow is Clyde's last name. Just I keep going back from Parker. So to help make this less confusing, I should have said this in the beginning, but I'm saying it now. Um, it's Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow. Okay, cool. More than 100 policemen, National Guardsmen, vigilantes, and local farmers surrounded them. On the morning of July 24th, Bonnie saw the policemen closing in and screamed. Clyde and Jones picked up their guns and started shooting. Buck, unable to move, kept shooting and was hit several times. Blanche by his side, Clyde hopped into a car but was shot in the arm and crashed into a tree. He, Bonnie, and Jones ran and then scrammed across the river. Clyde stole another car and drove them away. Buck died a few le- days later and Blanche was captured. Buck died of his head wound and pneumonia after surgery five days after the King's Daughter Hospital in Perry, Iowa. Clyde had been shot four times and Bonnie had been hit by numerous buckshot pellets. Jones parted company with them, continuing to Houston where his mother had moved. He was arrested there without incident on November 16th and returned to Dallas. After several months of recuperating, Bonnie and Clyde were back out robbing. They had to be careful, realizing that locals might recognize them and turn them in as had happened in Missouri and Iowa. To avoid scrutiny, they slept in their car at night and drove during the day. In 1933 of November, Jones was captured and told his story to the police, who learned of the close ties between Bonnie and Clyde and their families. This gave them idea by watching their families, police could establish an ambush when Bonnie and Clyde tried to contact them. When an ambush attempt that month endangered their mothers, Clyde became furious. He wanted to retaliate against the lawman, but his family convinced him that wouldn't be smart. Rather than seek revenge on those who threatened his family, Clyde focused on Eastman Prison Farm. In January of 1934, they helped Clyde's old friend, Raymond Hamilton, break out. A guard was killed and several prisoners hopped into the gateway car. A guard was killed and several prisoners hopped into the getaway car. One of those prisoners was Henry Methvin. After the other convicts went their own way, including Hamilton, who'd left after a dispute with Clyde, Methvin stayed on. The crime spree continued and included the brutal murder of two motorcycle cops, but the end was near. Methvin and his planning were to play a role in Bonnie and Clyde's demise. Police at this point knew that Bonnie and Clyde loved their family and would visit. Several ambushes were made so that these two could be captured or shot at, but they somehow always got away. This time, the police guessed that Bonnie, Clyde, and Henry were on their way to visit Iverson Methvin, Henry Methvin's father, in May of 1934. When police learned that Henry Methvin had become separated from Bonnie and Clyde on the evening of May 19th, they realized this was their chance to set up an ambush. Police assumed they would search for Henry at his father's farm, so they planned an ambush along the road the outlaws were expected to take. The six lawmen planning the ambush confiscated Iverson Methvin's truck and removed one of its tires then placed it along the highway of 154 between Sales and Gibslin, Louisiana. If Clyde saw Iverson's vehicle on the roadside, they figured he would slow down and investigate. Clyde fell into the trap. The lawman opened fire when the vehicle was still moving. Oakley fired first, probably before any order to do so. Clyde was killed instantly by Oakley's headshot, and Hinton reported hearing Parker scream. The officers fired about 130 rounds, emptying their weapons into the car. Many of Bonnie and Clyde's wounds had been fatal, Yet the two had survived several bullet wounds over the years in their confrontations with the law. The bullet-ridden deluxe, originally owned by Ruth Warren of Topeka, Kansas, was later exhibited at carnivals and fairs, then sold as a collector's item in 1988. The Prim Valley Resort and Casino in Las Vegas purchased it for some $250,000. Barrow's enthusiasm for cars was evident in a letter he wrote in earlier in the spring of 1934, addressed to Henry Ford himself. While I still got breath in my lungs, I will tell you that the dandy car you make. I have drove Ford exclusively when I could get away with one. For sustained speeds and freedoms for trouble, the Ford has got every other car skinned, and even if my business hasn't been strictly legal, it don't hurt anything to tell you what a fine car you got in the V8. Despite knowing what happened to the car afterwards, it's what happened to Bonnie and Clyde's body is what is known to be horrific. When the shooting ended, the policeman found the back of Clyde's head had exploded and part of Bonnie's right hand had been shot off. It was also interesting noted that Bonnie was still wearing Roy's wedding ring and had a tattoo on the inside of her right thigh with two interconnected hearts labeled Bonnie and Roy. Remember, Roy is her ex-husband. Um, when Roy found out about Bonnie's death, he was still in prison, and he actually said that he was glad that they both had died because it was because dying was better than being captured.
Their bodies were taken to Dallas and put on public view. Crowds gathered for a glimpse of the famous pair. A fence had to be set up as there were some who wanted souvenirs and they even tried to cut off Clyde's ear. Although Bonnie had requested that she be buried with Clyde, they were buried in different cemeteries according to their family wishes. Thousands of people gathered outside both Dallas funeral homes hoping for a chance to view the bodies. Bonnie was buried in the Fist Trap Cemetery on May 26th although she was moved in 1945 to New Crown Hill Cemetery in Dallas because of vandalism. Clyde's private funeral was held at sunset on May 25th. He was buried in Western Heights Cemetery in Dallas, next to his brother Marvin. By the summer of 1934, new federal statutes made bank robbery and kidnapping federal offenses. In 2018, it was reported that Bonnie and Clyde's kin hoped to bury the two together, as currently they are still nine miles apart. These two were no doubt a very important and iconic lovers in crime still to this very day. There's actually a video of an old news report about this case that came out during the time and it was shot the day of murder and then they made a reconstructed version of it days later. I will link the video below so that you guys can see it. Warning, you can see Bonnie's body, um, not Clyde's because she's leaning on Bonnie and the way the camera angle is, you won't be able to see him at all. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and stay sunny, friends.